Okay, so let's begin. <laughs> As a student of literature and eventually a professor of writing, I always had to question truth and its propositions. This practice foregrounded any interpretation or analysis of text from the witnessing of dubious characters in, in a grove to interrogations of various critical frameworks for students' thesis. There was no fundamental way of looking, no perspective champion. Truth was an idea dependent on the lens or filter one chose to view it in. What is true is not necessarily what is fact. It can be the authenticity of experience or the delight of insight. Enter 2016, Duterte and Oxford Word of the Year post-truth, which as a term taken out of context seems like a post-modernist dream. And the pluralism of truth, its emancipatory potential to highlight marginalized perspectives, once predominant now seem to work against what the humanities stood for. Examples we do not, we do not need to go into detail. A, sample, a simple visit to Moka Usan blog and Thinking Pinoy will show how facts have become distorted and alternative news subscribed to. Traditional media is not to be trusted. Intellectuals and academics are mere naysayers with a faculty for language. Never mind documentary or photographic evidence. What matters is how I feel about it, it says in medicines. So what to do in an overwhelming environment of lies and propaganda, despite it being in the news every day after Duterte's inauguration, it felt to me that there was not enough anger and protests against what eventually was termed extrajudicial killings or AJKs, murders by hooded men and police against um, what, uh, sorry, of, uh, and police encounters of Nanlaban lumped together um, and reported, but outside one's echo chamber, there was no outrage. Um, and so began the process of responding through poetry, finding the situation imperative as a graduate student who had to turn in poems as a requirement. There was no political agenda outside of my extreme agitation and anger at what used to average 33 deaths a day in the first two years of the Duterte's term. I had to document and document through ways familiar. Soon I looked for other poets who were writing about the ethical and moral depra depravity of Duterte's rule and commiserated with those who contributed in the Kill This Chronicles, an online, and I quote, an online repository of protest literature in Duterte's time, end quote. While searching for what topics or news events were already explored through imaginative writing, I stumbled upon an online discussion on Rebecca D. Anunevo, a poet and professor who writes in Filipino and is known for feminist and progressive works such as Baguang Mabae and Pananahan. Her admiration for the president became apparent, and this was not limited to commentary and sharing a favorable to the administration news report, she also wrote poems. Though surprised, I was hardly disillusioned since there was a lack of familiarity on my part with Anya Nevo's work, having studied mostly Filipino poets in English. What came as a shock to me was Simeon Dumdum Jr.'s poetry and inclusion of a poem on Duterte that was in the anthology Blood Dust, Philippine Protest Poetry from Marcos to Duterte. Dumdum was a personal favorite, having encountered him in creative writing classes through poems such as Third World Opera and Epithalam Yun. He is what you would call a writer's writer, someone who's, who was accessible yet had nuance in depth. He had verses mixing funny with painful. His earlier poems were guides on how to be public yet personal. He was a literary hero. Then he started writing about the president and though seemingly ambivalent in political stance, upon closer reading, one could see his political biases. That got me into thinking about power in literature and essentially what is true in poetry. It was not that I could not respect a varied or opposing position. It was that I certainly did not expect it of a poet who wanted to kick the proverbial governor in the groin. Conchitina Cruz, in an interview with Corday Poetry Review, discussing her response to those who expressed outrage over Anya Nevo's photo with Duterte and answering the question, how could the poet do this, says, oh, sorry. Let me just move my slide. We are so accustomed to thinking of poetry or art as a bastion of resistance that we are unsettled when we see that it is also a bastion of complicity. It could be, it can be an accomplice of tyranny and oppression. It can be co-opted. If you serve the administration of our misogynist and fascist president, then you are a tool for enforcing and extolling this regime's violence against Filipinos, end quote. Through co-opted poetry, we see the same characteristics of false truth and misinformation, and yet I put forth how even more dangerous and sinister it is compared to fake news. For in poetry, we expect truth, the authenticity of feeling, and in post truth, a preference for feeling over fact that when brought together legitimizes that which is not, conceals rather than uncovers, speaking truth to power lies. If literature is supposed to ground us, illuminate after the journey of plurality and ambiguity, 
How then can we account for poetry that explicitly sides with the status quo and uses knowledge from fake news or access fake news by repainting a rhetorically and otherwise violent president into a loving father and son who wants nothing but the best for the country? So I go to my discussion um, a little bit about post-truth. Um, post-truth is defined by the Oxford Dictionaries as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal beliefs. Poetry can be said to already exist in a post-truth paradigm as its truth is not anchored on objective fact or the veracity of an event, but is dependent on the process of discovering truths about humanity and our relationship to our world. And it operates not in conclusions or definitive answers. It raises a conundrum within a conundrum. For poetry creates imaginary worlds to tell us truths about the world we live in. And its profoundest truth of all is that truth always escapes us. Andrew Motion, um, it, po uh, former poet laureate um, in the UK in his talk, Truth and Poetry, says poetry can be useful in a post-truth society because poets um, can speak truth to power in obvious and blazing ways. They can write satires that expose corruption, they can attack governments, they can write love poems that give other lovers a voice, elegies that help people in grief mourn. They can give the light as Plato himself allows, they can catch the zeitgeist at any given time and in this way contribute to our understanding of history. Using a language that holds an equal balance of opposites and resisting or subverting other kinds of rational discourse in offering linguistic playfulness, metaphorical richness, symbolical density, and as alternative but equally useful ways to understand their experience. The same literary devices that illuminate, that to familiarize, can in fact be used to confuse, side with the oppressor by advocating for poetry being its own reality, um, this is Heaney, and that political reality is secondary to an ultimate fidelity to the demands and promise of the artistic event. Um, so a quote from Seamus Heaney in um, the um, government of the tongue. Yet the role of poetry, even when factual truth is not expected, is also said to sift through our untruths, unwinding the narratives we've come to accept about where we live and who we are. After all, poetic truth, despite its various definitions, ultimately boils down to one certainty. It is the work of the imagination that reveals to us in so many different ways what it means to be human. But to be imprisoned by beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all we need, you know, on earth and all we need to know, is a romantic ideal that is hard to apply in an increasingly fractured world. What do we believe in if facts are not to be trusted and truth and beauty have as much subjectivity as a number of people living on earth? Um, as Anna Arendt says, factual truths are never compellingly true. The historian knows how vulnerable is the whole texture of facts in which we spend our daily life. It is always in danger of being perforated by single lies or torn to shreds by the organized lying of groups, nations or classes or denied and distorted often carefully covered up by reams of falsehoods or simply allowed to fall into oblivion. Facts need testimony to be remembered and trustworthy witnesses to be established in order to find a secure dwelling place in the domain of human affairs. The poet can do this witnessing, which Caroline Forshe de defines as neither martyrdom nor the saying of a judicial truth, but the owning of one's infinite responsibility for the other one. Um, would it then be fair to say that if historical facts and news are to be suspected, can poetic truth in acting as a witness in poetry be trusted? Or is it also a matter of relativism and that there are political lines in poetry that are drawn that, is, that it becomes difficult to determine what is true? As we will see in the two poets of this study, just as there are versions of truth in a post-fact world through, the news and through news and political speeches, so does post-truth in poetry exist? in its pretense of ambivalence strengthened by literary techniques and adaptation of the rhetoric perpetuated by the state. I look at the political poems of Anyo Nevo and Dumdum Dum that engaged to Duterte and the drug war, um, 13 in total, 8 for Anyo Nevo and 5 for Dumdum. Dum. In studying the poems, I explore the intersections of poetic devices and rhetorical devices found in post-truth by looking at metaphor, point of view, language, play, irony, and humor. For the most part, especially with the first poet, I examine context to analyze content, arguing that without the benefit of outside reference or intertextuality, it would be hard to determine the politics of the poems. I include the social context of poems operate in, especially, specifically the news which possibly triggered the utterance, as well as personal statements. I then examine patterns and them thematic preoccupations in the poems that confront issues in the Duterte administration and use as lens concepts in post-truth. So move on to Rebecca T. Anyonevo, um, is a writer and professor. She currently heads the Novotas Polytechnic College and was a former teacher at Miriam College. 
She has won palancas and other awards for her works and is the author of seven collections of poetry. In 2016, she served in the Presidential Communications Operations Office, or PCOO, but left the post after a year of employment due to personal reasons. Anya Nevo is one of some prominent writers vocal in their support of Duterte, and in, in an interview, she states her awareness of those who are critical of her stance. Her co-fellows, Indilangan Sa Imahe, Retorica, at Anyo Orlira, an organization of writers in Filipino, are baffled by her being a Duterte advocate, partly because she has always been outspoken when it comes to human rights violations. She responds, My own it's weird to say this as if I had any influence. We're perhaps asking, what of those poems she wrote against injustice and lies and corruption and abuse of power? They ask, how could the poet do this in reference to my decision to work within the administration in its first year? You should ask, how have I responded to the attacks? In viewing herself as the target of attacks by her critics, Anya never reinforces her position as a victim. This is contradictory to assumptions of co-opted poetry, for she does not see her subject position as part of the majority or the ruling party, but instead as someone vilified for her political views. In the poem, Historia ng Makata, one of six poems she wrote in a prolific period, in the week after Kian de los Santos' death, the speaker likens herself to a witch burned at the stake, using poems she wrote for the administration. Um, and then here is a, a portion of her, this poem, well, um, no mercy. I'll just read the English translations. Um, I, I did the translations myself, so just so the flow is um, continuous. So, no mercy for poets who defend the ruthless king and murderer. Enacting in a poem a perception of victimhood, one who suffers for her beliefs and of being in the minority when those in their wondrous tower or toring maginhawa gang up, gang up on her. Anyo Nevo continues to write with the conviction that she is persecuted and therefore acts as a witness whose truth-telling urge and the compulsion to identify with the oppressed becomes necessarily integral with the act of writing itself. Um, that's again a quote from Hini. She is to her mind speaking for those who are forced to be silent. Though Anyo Nevo can see her position as demonized, her other poems are in fact reiterations of the same rhetoric by a powerful state. Despite the suspicious police encounters and vigilante killings encouraged by the president through his public pronouncements on the war on drugs, she says, as with the EJK, who in their right mind was subscribed to it, that this message to the police and the military is to make sure that you come out alive in a legitimate operation. You don't shoot at suspects when they raise their arms and surrender or kneel or plead for mercy. Uniformed people and vigilantes who kill, who kill helpless civilians do not have the sanctions of government." End quote. On the subject of the Marcus burial, which Anya Nebo was vehemently against, the object of blame is not her beloved president, but the Supreme Court, which Duterte does not control. She adds, he even said that if the SC ruled against his position, he would respect their decision. And on the third, this controversial joke on an Australian missionary who was a victim of rape, she's, uh, when he said, Napakaganda dapat mayor muna ang mauna, and you never argue so that their speeches should always be taken in context. And that what the then presidential candidate meant was that the mayor should have arrived at the scene first so that he could have saved the woman. For her, his vile language and potty mouth are all extensions of a macho culture he grew up in and that she's reminded of her grandfather, who she has no affection for but has shown much love for her. Elsewhere, in a letter addressed to the president entitled Ang Lolo Ko, published on her public Facebook page, Anya Neville is all the progressive initiatives the president has committed to, such as the renewal of peace talks and Balik OFW program. And thanks to Terry for a strong defense of the Filipino people against other nations who insult the country. The poet also reiterates in both aforementioned letter and interview with Tom Sykes, author of The Realm of Punisher Travelers in the Duterte's Philippines, that she knows actions speak louder than words, and that in the end, the president will not be measured by his words, but by his deeds. How do these pronouncements manifest in her poetry? In My Oras Karen Duterte, or You'll Have Your Time Duterte, the poet in almost one, actually, it's actually two sentences, one long sentence addressing the president, uses the strategy of misdirection, starting with what seems to be a defense of Duterte amidst the rage of non-believers. But it's actually a rant on the system of corruption that has ex existed long before Rodrigo's time. By sandwiching the focus on those who disappeared for it is not the season of blossoming and those who wish to hold on to power, inside two sections which provide a counterpoint, a Rodrigo who is simple and pure in intention, but also acts as if he doesn't and does not want to belong there, and you never succeed in depicting an erstwhile mayor unwilling to embrace the presidency. The strategy of weaving in figurative language to describe men who are drunk on power and paralleling them with the Messiah who sacrifices himself for the greater good is convincing, since the lyric elevates 
the cause from the mundane. See um, her mention of sak Sakura and the resting of the afternoon, the tsunami of followers, even the mouth quivering or trembling. And she does this by not completely exculpating Duterte. He is impatient and quick to anger someone who has a foul mouth that we see it as if the speaker is of two minds and merely decides in the end to go for the littlest fellow, the most humble one. The interesting here, thing here is in this poem, Anu Nevo does not use metaphors to describe Duterte, perhaps recognizing that to do that would be a conventional approach in publicity, instead using it for everybody else in the poem, critics, supporters, psychop psychopathic politicians. Duterte is the totoong tao that does not need metaphors to applaud him. Even the title that plays with the double meaning of my oras karin, that can mean you'll get what is due you as it's signifying karma, or you'll have your time to signify redemption, urges its reader to rethink assumptions about the president. In Mamao Police, the poet reiterates that the law is clear and nobody should follow an illegal order. The command given by the highest chief who curses and threatens must not be lost in the din of shots fired. Only when the accused resists or nanlaban or retaliates must the cop use his gun. So despite the Duterte announcing his wishes to fatten the fish in Manila Bay by killing all drug pushers, hold up men and do nothings, and Hitler massacred three million Jews, there's three million drug addicts, I'd be happy to slaughter them. The policemen in the poem are to interpret this and seek the correct context of the order. These declarations are to be taken figuratively as just the brash, strong men speak of a president who loves his people so much that his irrationality is evidence of his seriousness in eliminating the drug problem. She adds in the interview, but this president, despite his foul mouth, is in charge, acts right away, listens to the people, allows criticism and street protests against him. In Bata, Anyo Nevo decries the brutality of the police force in the murder of a child. Written in August 19, 2017 and published at the same time as Daga, a poem on how drugs are like rats, one can deduce that this is the poet's actual response to Kian de los Santos's death. And yet similar to Mamao Police, nowhere does she directly vilify Duterte, instead focusing on the systemic problem of drugs among the urban poor and the villainous behavior of lawless cops. In Bata, the speaker concludes, Codding's the problem, one upmanship, this is mine, my bonus. Conveniently excluding any investigation on corrupt policemen and who or what enables them, providing instead a simplified version, it is purely ego and reward that drive cops to kill. Though not entirely untrue, the oversimplification of the situation to that of ninja cops avoids delving deeper into the root cause of police brutality and corruption, reminiscent of Duterte's insistence that the biggest problem of the country is drugs, and a citation of numbers to exaggerate the issue which has since been debunked by the Dangerous Drugs Board. This willful ignorance is also seen in Anyo Nevo's poem Daga, where she lists the places where drugs can be found, um, in the streets and its corners, in houses like matches, in a box, inside the prison cell, in towers admirable, in Congress when whimsy is enabled. Exacerbating the falsehood that the drug menace in the Philippines has taken hold of all sectors of society and making it palpable through the use of rats as a metaphor, a real test that must be eradicated at all costs, strengthening the case for the violent war on drugs. But again, um, we are reminded that the author does not condone EJK, as like she said in her interview. She does state that it is the drug lords who have brought the brains and souls of ordinary Filipinos so that out of poverty, illiteracy, and lack of jobs, they enter this dangerous illegal drug trade that Duterte hates. End quote. Failing to examine where, where poverty, illiteracy, and lack of jobs come from in the first place. Also at the level of image, there is no escaping the subjectivity of the writer against those who use drugs. Here, through the tenor of the vehicle is illegal drugs themselves, the anthropomorphism of rats turns it metonymical, unable to ignore the association of rats to drug users. Um, oh, sorry, I, okay. So, kill one and they breed more. Who knows what crevices the glazed ones gnaw at? Um, scavenging the garbage bin, toppling it over, leftovers fall on the kitchen floor. This narrative is complicated by the rats who, even after encountering a dead man, are without fear. At this point, we are given some background on the dead. He is a Nanlaban victim who raises his arms to surrender but is shot anyway. The poet comments on the scene as, um, the stench thickens as day breaks and leaves it there. She returns to the hard to kill rats who she says we wrongfully think of disappeared. There is a difference to billions of drugs that disappeared switching. Sorry, there is a reference to billions of drugs that disappeared switching to the literal description of the drugs. But in the end, she returns to her metaphor and this time there is a change. 
in the dead of the night while some sing the video okay be careful the pests are soon to attack are these still the drugs she refers to or the hooded men at night to kill even those to surrender the shift in what is signified and the ambiguous ending are moves that are quite similar to the fallacy of equivocation which Anya Neva through puns in other poems does often by making the reader think about who the real pest or enemy is, she would have succeeded in assuming a voice that is uncertain, creating some confusion about who should be held accountable in the drug war. Yet she leaves the reader hanging, the address in the narrative left to fend for himself, which poetry allows. Anya Nevo is fond of using this literary technique in her poetry. She does the same in Bata, where Bata is both child and turf or territory. Bata, Bata. In Limpio, she puns Limpio, which means clean in Besaya and Tiempo, pork belly. Punning, lends a playful quality to these poems, making light a serious topic like um, police impunity. Aside from changing metaphors and punning, the poet also sometimes shifts the voice of the speaker. In Pangamuyo, the persona in three stanzas moves from the point of view of uh, Abraham to a voice that raises objections on the rights of the wicked to live, and finally to actual executioner. Here, Anyoneva adapts the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, assuming the voice of a bargaining Abraham who pleads with God to spare the lives of the righteous people in the two cities, specifically of Lot and his family. The persona who initially appears to defend the good of humanity moves away from the source text by now asking if there is an evil person with power who without fear forfeits lives in a peaceful community, would you defend his right to live? The speaker is no longer imploring God to save lives, but takes it upon himself to question the rights of other people particularly those who are evil. The evildoers are represented by images of terror, swollen tentacles, souls roped, and arrogant darkness laughing. They are nameless but are drawn to terrify that in the end when the speaker asks, what is my place if I kill those who kill, the reader is inclined to agree with the elimination of those who terrorize. This is a prayer of questioning of whether God who sees his men as sinful and ready to destroy them would punish someone who would also be doing God's work by cleansing the nation. Mark Angeles, a poet in Filipino, observes, for sure, and I'm translating him also, um, for sure it is not Anyo Nevo who murdered those who murder, at least literally. What do we know? If this is metaphorical, for sure this is written in support of Duterte's war on drugs, to refer to this specific poem. Uh, if this is endorsement for EJK's, then the doubting is mere posture, yet in its lack of answers, for God does not respond after all, its catechism unfulfilled with an ending not meant to instruct, this is not explicit. Emily Dickinson's well-known opening line, tell the truth but tell its land, complicates the notion of poetic truth by circumvention, as the truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind, preferring a circuitous, circuitous route to the shockingness of truth. Through indirectness, one is able to grow through the process of discovery and by, be surprised by the truth in ways that are also surprising. The ambivalence of Anyoneva's speakers and the indirectness that she employs by changing tenor, varying denotations and connotations, and even point of view befuddles instead of clarifies, so that one walks away from the poem doubting, about, doubting how one should feel about mass murder. Perhaps there is a working out of these ethical conundrums in Anyoneva's poems because the very nature of poetry demands it. In her interviews, it seems like the poet has already made her mind up. The territory will not go outside the bounds of the law. Yet her poetry lacks this, lacks this assuredness. Could this be a processing of conviction that does not exist in rhetoric where persuasion is paramount, or simply her decades of poetic craft preventing her from forming lazy truths? Or maybe a cognitive dissonance exists in the writer through her poems and articulation of politics, her favoring Duterte's policies, and stands despite human rights violations committed under his governance, which is best exemplified by Daga. In the face of overwhelming opinion against the president and his hard line decisions, there is a necessity to adapt the same language of exclusion, of creating a common enemy out of drug lords and users to settle these contradictions, that even the poems themselves, there is some form of inquiry and meditation, easily settle into one answer. The president still knows what's best. Let's move on to Simeon Dum Dum Jr. Um, Simeon Dum Dum Jr. is a poet and retired judge. He served as the regional trial court executive judge in Cebu City for 15 years. Like Anyo Nevo, he has won several Palanca Awards and is the author of 11 books of poetry. He once entered the seminary but left it to take up law. Dum Dum is now 72 years old. In January 2018, he, along with other Filipino writers and gatekeepers such as Anyo Nevo, Christine Godinez Ortega, who was workshop director of the Iliga National Writers Workshop, and Jaime Andim, um, who was 2017 workshop director of the Suleiman University National Writers Workshop, signed a manifesto declaring Rappler as a source of fake news while also reiterating support for Duterte's policies. This move seemed to be rooted in the general distrust the government has put 
on traditional media, and Rattler, although mainly an online news platform, was his specific mark. Accused of partisan news coverage and media bias because of its news and features that were critical of the administration, Rappler continues to be t the target of the president's ire. Yet prior to this expression of solidarity with other Duterte supporters, Dum Dum was already part of an anthology of protest poetry, um, the mentioned Bloodlust. The poem, A Chance Encounter with Rodrigo Duterte in the Men's Room, begins with, One day we met Digong and I, which meeting was unusual for we were standing side by side before a men's urinal. The setup is clear enough, and for the next seven stanzas, we are told straightforwardly in rhyme and meter, the speaker's encounter with the president in the washroom. They have one interaction. He glanced at me and I at him with on my face a smile, but he did not reciprocate. I was just rank and file. While the stanza above may seem like an indirect hit at the authoritative figure, one who did not return the speaker's greeting of a smile, the style Dum Dum writes, it leaves room for interpretation, especially when followed by the lines, and it would not be presidential to warm to anyone, as if Digong would have smiled if not for his position, rendering him imprisoned in the expectations of his office, a passive participant in an unwanted role. Then he goes on to say, the thing was to do just one's business, of body or the state, paints Duterte as a no-nonsense leader, and yet the reader is not sure if the speaker welcomes this behavior from his chief or he would rather the president act another way. The ambiguity is molded by the choice of details to present, word choice, and the lightness associated with the rhyme. Doom Doom ends with, they say that he killed criminals or ordered their arrest. If they would not put up a fight, of this he would but dress. But here at this latrine, I relish the opportunity to have, with such as precedents, a shared humanity. The rhyme scheme and uniformity in meter, though varying quatrain to quatrain, lends a lighthearted sound that renders speaker and subject childlike, as if we're in a Doctor Seuss story whose main character just happens to be a president misunderstood. There are poems where Digong is made fun of, his statements satirized and exposed for their lack of coherence, such as the viral, the kit, um, which uh, came out this year where his ignorance of the virus is highlighted. But here, are we supposed to be laughing at him when the speaker sounds in awe of the encounter, um, he says in the poem, finding it rare, this favor. Um, and this act of killing criminals only something they say. How can it be satirical when Dum Dum does not only wash the Duterte's hands of the crime, he even lets him joke in the end. Of this he would but jest. The last stanza, though tongue-in-cheek, um, and implies that outside the politics of a comfort room, there can be no shared humanity with Digong. It um, still leaves room for interpretation. But because Dum Dum uses diction such as relish and opportunity and ends the whole thing with the word humanity, the poem elevates the encounter and urges us to humanize the president. Could this have been said mockingly for it was categorized as protest? Would this simply be a bringing down of who others view as a hegemon or does it intend to humble the Duterte's image? Either way, it works with the president's advantage since the basement also succeeds in making him just like one of us. He's not Imelda likened to Queen Esther who saves her countrymen from death. Duterte is the everyman, the bugui bugui that likes to joke around. In Dum Dum's poetry, we do not have the advantage of a biographical reading like Anyo Nevos as he rarely releases if any statements referring to the president. Though he shares positive news about this administration and assigned the manifesto against Rappler, the most direct though unclear mode he engages in politics is through his poetry. Aside from the poem above, he has two others where Duterte is named. Prayer for Rodrigo Duterte, written in May 2016, a week before Duterte was declared the winner of the presidential elections. And Time and Rodrigo Duterte, written a few months into his term. These and two, the two other poems included in Blood Dust will reveal to us that irony here acts as a subterfuge. Though there are moments when the speaker probes the intention of Rodrigo in the poem Prayer for Rodrigo Duterte, the last image the reader is definitely positive. The prayer is no longer just a prayer to the Lord asking him to guide the president to be. It transforms Duterte into Christ. Um, sorry. I think it's one. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, when he says, kneeling before him and was sacrificed, his arms outstretched as were the arms of Christ. Early on in the poem, the speaker puts up an earnest defense of Duterte despite his faults by saying it is God who knows what is really in the heart. Um, but who can judge this except yourself, Lord, he says in the poem, and extends it to, Lord, he's a man who thinks little of killing. That was what he said when he was campaigning. Of course, he meant slaying the criminals above all those who disregard the signals. 
If this sounds familiar, it is because it is the same strategy by Anu Nevo and the various presidential spokespersons who Duterte appointed, Ernesto Abella, Salvador Padello, and Harry Roque, who all claim that the president's oratory must not be taken seriously, that he be read in context, and a non-literal approach be taken. This kind of cast citing and double speak has been present in this administration, and Anu Nevo accounts for this by quoting the president in his inaugural address. I know the limits of the power and authority of the president. I know what is legal and what is not. As saying all the statements about killing criminals are me as if saying that all the statements about killing criminals are mere bombast. Actions over words and these actions will always be legal. And Dum Dum in the poem he continues, For them to stop, but Lord, all life belongs to you who heal and rectify all wrongs. But people cannot wait, they are impatient, and the police and courts are inefficient. So hang the law, we all want to be safe. Are we each of us really that naive? This juxtaposition, juxtaposition of teachings of the Bible with real life concerns where God's commandment of thou shall not kill, all life belonging to him, and blending that in um, that stanza with what the people need, the spiritual versus the practical, echoes Anu Nevo's prayer and her attempt to reconcile what Christianity teaches with what the peaceful nation requires. What Dum Dum does different, aside from being more direct in treatment than Anu Nevo, is in the certainty that rhyme brings. When a rhyme scream is utilized, not only does this playfulness emerge a kind of logic because of the expectation of the coming rhyme is felt. There is order in the pattern and manners of persuasion. These become effective in making the argument sound true. In time and Rodrigo Duterte, um, this poem counters a bloodthirsty image of the president by declaring at the onset, of course, if you hate him, nothing he does will merit your thumbs up, implying irrational hate and bashing without basis. He then goes on to describe a photograph of Duterte, which accompanies the original publication on Facebook, with the president checking his watch amid Coke cans. Then the question, why should he check his watch? Why should he be like us? As if speaking for the rest who hate him, who does not see his ordinary with a shared humanity, and who unnecessarily view him as a behemoth to, out to kill criminals. Then, but for Rodrigo Duterte, there is no time to kill. Time is a fugitive, but not a criminal, who like Schrodinger's cat at once both lives and dies. The moments must arrive, whatever the consensus. How truly undemocratic are the clock's hands which never go up for a viva voce. The simile and personification of time diffuse grave implications of Duterte and his pronouncements on killing. Time here functions as a metaphor, idiom, rationale, going from time as a fugitive, fugitive time like Schrodinger's cat, time that must arrive, whatever the consensus, time as undemocratic, time that does not go up for a viva voce, time that is hated by Shaw but sends into Shaw who believes in capital pan punishment, to the Duterte checking time to see if there are no mons failing to join his shadow. These different associations to time, connecting it to Duterte's image of a punisher who will not kill time, of time as a necessity, like what his actions for the nation are, despite it being undemocratic and unpopular, of a dramatist who hates time but endorses capital punishment, to parts of time or the timepiece, specifically the sundial, who refuse to support Duterte, to finally a working family man just like us who worry about eating appointments and the safety of our children. Is Dum Dum using the image to generate, generate various connections, all that sound true and sensible? The strength of the metaphor, both as Dulce and Eutil, uh, the vehicle and the various concepts it carries just feels right. Duterte is not a ruthless ruler with an iron hand. He is a father worrying about his daughter and therefore his children, the Filipinos. The dramatic situation of the speaker appears as if he's in a quandary or working out of the poet, the of the poet, the various arguments for and against the drug war, but ending with an answer. Um, note that the punctuation at the end of the poem is not a question mark, an indicative of the author humanizing the president who is after the best interests of his kitty and constituents. And by using a tone that is ambivalent and light, Dum Dum avoids spreading falsehood and embodies the poet as he nothing affirm it and therefore never lie. A quote by Sidney. Um, creating poetic Poetic fiction, as opposed to using actual news reports, causes a suspension of disbelief and a consideration of the goodness of Duterte's intentions. There is no irony present here, and the only method in which we can ascertain where the poet stands in a chance encounter, and these two other protest poems, is by reading them alongside these other verses. Um, Street Scene and Ode to the Last and Smallest Tomato on the Table, um, two poems also anthologized in Blood Dust, are more cunning in its diversions. The Tokhang victim in the first barely a figure after lines and lines of speculating wittily whether there is a body. In the second, the smallest tomato acts as a metaphor for a presumably innocent individual who should not be hurt or killed by gun or knife like the criminals on the streets, never mind that there are innocents murdered and branded as collateral damage. 
the whitewashing of the president's image and the sidestepping of uneasy topics related to the extrajudicial killing send an opacity to Dumdum's work and his politics, which may or may not be deliberate and would not be up for scrutiny or debate if not for his inclusion in a protest poem anthology against Duterte's drug war. In seeing the ways he defends Duterte, Duterte in the other poems, it sounds more and more the work of an apologist. Motion in the same talk expressed that poetry is valuable to the Republic, especially in a time of post-truth because it enables us to get out of a binary world of alternative judgments and is useful in understanding and deconstructing a world muddled by fake news. We can be in at least two minds where poetry enacts attentions that exist when we encounter a moral dilemma or when we are unsure of what to believe in. Though at face value, it may seem that Dumdum is examining these beliefs and asking the difficult questions of the president's intention and motivation, and in turn, the reader's perceptions upon closer reading and taken all together, these poems where Duterte is not a larger than life figure, but simply a father, a son, and someone who is slowly doing his business at the toilet, allow an accessibility and vulnerability that benefits rather than frauds, that is a defense rather than an inquiry. It would be a generalization to say that on the basis of these poems and the others of Tom Dumps and Blood Dust were the subject of the victims of the drug war literally kept under a tarp, that the judge is a court poet. But are these not acting like fake news, feigning to be poems without a palpable design, without judgment of the man or his actions, and yet really no different than Cesar T. Melia's poems for Imelda, whose portraits of Imelda Marcos conversely elevate her to the level of Greek goddess. And through its use of poetic devices could be classified his poetry as ironic, a facetious take on an otherwise deadly issue. After all, the Dum Dum is best known for the widely anthologized Third World Opera, a humorous attack on Philippine traditional politicians who are too dumb to know, they are really meant to be kicked in the nether regions because the actor who does the kicking, among others, remembered the dictator, the government's master, and his sins against the people. This, though written in the late 80s, gives the impression that the poet is against fascism, so his Duterte poems might come across as ironic. You have to consider that without the actual text exhibiting characteristics of um, satire or irony is fallacious. If anything, the poems are critical not of the president but his critics. So poetry has been used for propaganda, and it may be naive to expect a poetic truth that sides with humanity. After all, poets in their capacity as unacknowledged legislators of the world have made claims that do not necessarily unsubscribe to notions of common good. Though there is an impression that most poets are left-oriented because many who thrive come from the academe in a small pool of learned, like-minded individuals, there can be no denying that mouthpieces of the government have existed and will continue to exist. Poets who wrote in the service of the government, whether fascistic or otherwise, have been lumped together and given different labels throughout history, such as propaganda poets who refer to British writers who wrote in support of their nation's role in World War I, and right-wing poets in the United States quick to promote conservative ideals. In the Philippines, the most recent example of co-opted poets is the new society writers of former dictator Ferdinand E. Marcos, such as Adrian Cristobal and Kirima Polotan, who held positions in government and wrote literary texts that would have pleased the formalists and fascists in their technical brilliance and lack of social engagement. Marcos's government also employed court poets in Melia, Guillermo de Vega, and Alejandrino Hofana. On January 28, 1986, writers and journalists allied with Marcos released a declaration refusing the special elections, which eventually saw Corazon Aquino voted into office, and insisting Marcos stay in power, um, uh, as you can see in this, uh, in, on the screen. Um, some of these writers and artists have gained prominence and have been gifted with the position of national artists. The interesting thing to note here is, um, in relation to our study, is as with the aforementioned statement of writers against Rappler, Dum Dum also signed the 1986 declaration. Cruz is right, writers have been and continue to be co-opted by a barbaric regime with only the techniques of propaganda or poetry possibly changing. In the case of Anyo Nebo and Dum Dum's poetry, we find the humanizing of the president in a downplaying of violent events specifically related to the war on drugs. The former conceals culpability by not including the president for the most part in her poems, his name only uttered in one, as a poetic response to time in Rodrigo Duterte. So that poem, um, You'll Have Your Time Duterte, is actually a response to Doom Doom's time in Rodrigo Duterte. And you never utilizes the same rhetoric of her former office to interpret Duterte's pronouncements and invites the reader to accept that these are only words, but matters are his actions. She takes on his defense by focusing on the periphery, the child, the cop, drugs, and drug users. The latter poet, meanwhile, uses diversion and indirection, comfortable in the spaces poetry allows for ambiguity. Yet through the poems, though the poems give the impression of indecisiveness because of rhyme and humor, their manner of concluding actually takes a side. 
Dumdum's poets' poems lend to a false sense of struggle when it actually lightens the discourse surrounding Duterte and his policies. It is hard to determine the writer's politics initially because of this ambivalence, mistaken for dissent. Both Anyo Nebo and Dumdum pray for the president in their poems, the former imploring an Old Testament God to spare not his innocents, but those who use their own means to punish the wicked. The latter prays for Duterte himself, whose heart is in the right place. They also use language play and punning, which shifts in meaning delightful and confusing. There is faint ambiguity in tone through the form of questioning or processing, acting as if there's no irritable reaching for fact. Both poets perpetuate the image of Duterte the state wishes to portray by casting him as an obedient son to Nanay Soleng, a biblical hero, a messiah, a victim of the elites, a simple human being, a humble individual, despite and because of being uncouth and unrefined. He is the antithesis of the descente, but he gets the job done because of his pure intention. intentions. Based on the works of Anyo Nebo and Dumdum, post-truth poetry, if we could call it that, therefore conceals rather than reveals and uses contradictions and indirection to the advantage of a tyrant. Post-truth poetry, even with an exclusive readership, may be seen as more damaging than fake news as literary devices just as metaphor and rhyme can easily bury politics in pseudo-dialectics. It can legitimize fake news in case and direct thoughts complicit to the killings and deepen understanding and conviction of falsely rooted ideologies when poetry should represent, again a quote from Nini, solidarity with the doomed, the deprived, the victimized, and underprivileged. Post-truth poetry can rehash arguments that the state says in its defense. It purports to not having an agenda by way of poetic craft. Though Ramon Guillermo proposes that the Duterte's brand of authoritarianism is no need for poets and pseudo-philosophers, um, because the president's unintelligible outburst is the truth of today's politics, there can be no denying that poets are writing about the Duterte and his government in a manner that aggrandizes him. What is not clear is the readership or audience. If court poets are employed by former president and dictator Marcos, so that it would appear his decisions were founded and civilized in literate speech, who are the Duterte allied literary writers serving? Are these poets trying to convince the general public of truths about the Duterte that are otherwise buried in his statements? And again, to read them in context, as Anyo Nevo says, are they painting him in a flattering light to persuade their fellow writers of the goodness of his intentions? And what influence do these writers have? There is no poem in recent history that has affected policy and governance, its contribution to culture and society possibly tangible only in the future. Yet in a country hostile to its critics with the new law set to stifle dissent, um, which is the anti-terror law, voices that resist and oppose the dominant discourse must be amplified and support for tyrannical rule called out. It is important to examine a cultural production that reinforces a government's lies. What can counter this? The romantic answer, of course, is more poetry. Jim Pascual Agustin is a Filipino poet who is now based in South Africa, writes poems that they respond directly to Anyo Nevos. Other poets through the Kill List Chronicles continue to publish poetry of resistance. Small independent publishers such as Mag Magpies, who came out with a satirical pamphlet faux photo album that interrogate the reverence of Duterte supporters for their tatai, hold the line of democracy in an increasingly despotic rule. But to say that this is enough is illusory. The pushback can come from poetry, literary criticism, calling out, and more importantly, actual activism. On the other hand, it would be literary fascism to say that the poems that align with the status quo are the right to not have a place in literature. It is important to read these poets and see how they negotiate their notions of what is true, factual, crucial to a society, if only to avoid excess existing in an echo chamber and not succumbing to a form of homogenous resistance. Are they supposed to disorient, displace, dismantle, deconstruct? We need to further examine how it has been weaponized to serve power and control the narrative. Perhaps a reminder of where a writer should stand in a world of conflict must also be made. Philippines graphic editor, well, the former Philippines graphic, now they closed recently, um, editor Joel Pablo Saludin, an essay touching on writers and the roles in a state that inflicts terror as, what plausible reason does a writer have to defy his own awareness of the human condition to take the side of the oppressor? He then names Anyonevo, Dumdum, and Lita Gadi as poets who have unflinching support for Duterte and implies that Duterte is his oppressor and tyrant. Though he qualifies his assertion by saying he is used to contrasting opinions and debates between writers, Salud ends with, there are absolute truths as well as relative truths and a writer of some experience safeguards credibility and human lives by knowing the difference, which to some extent gives a provisional answer to questions of poetic truth and post-truth and reinforces the need to analyze co-opted poetry. Lee McIntyre in his treatise on post-truth reminds us that there is no such thing as false equivalence or the notion that the truth probably lies somewhere between political ideologies. For him, the halfway point between truth and error is still error. Though part, party lines for partisanship is not the province of poetry, poetic truth can be held accountable to the party of humanity. 
uh, this is for Shea, with humanity defined as a rejection of unwarranted pain inflicted on some humans by others, of illegitimate dom domination. And while poetry traditionally has not been a place for factual truth or for some purist politics in an undemocratic environment where thousands have been killed with impunity, it is equally important to look at the content of the poems and to check them against actual events, for they reinforce power through methods that can convincingly carry truth and beauty. It can, feel it can feel true because we are seduced by the image in terms of language, unconscious of ways they can turn insidious. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Vasquez. Um, you can unshare your screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll now hear from uh, your reactor, Professor Conchitina Cruz. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, congrats, Vix. And uh, thank you for this timely, hang on, sorry. Sorry about that. Hello? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So thank yes. you for this timely, necessary discussion on what you call post-truth poetics. I look forward to reading this lecture in its final published form. Zadie Smith in Intimations observes that the political efficacy of art is often overstated, and the overstating is often done by the artists themselves. The people sometimes demand change, she writes, they almost never demand art. I bring this up as a way to appreciate the lecturer's demand to hold poets accountable for enabling fascist rule in their poems, no matter how fringe or niche poetry is. A tenuous connection to time and necessity is no excuse to settle on the comfy enclave of aesthetic autonomy, especially when the current regime in its early years explicitly borrowed from literary discourse to justify its disinformation campaign. From Moka Usan invoking symbolism to explain a fake photo of the Marawi siege to Malacanang calling on the public to deploy creative imagination to comprehend the president's incoherent uh, statements, to, the sa to that sasas -sa quip Senator Pangilinan wants to punish fake news, it's like punishing people for writing fiction. Ambiguity, uncertainty, and subjectivity, which are mined and valorized in literature, are instrumentalized by the state to perpetuate its violence. The state has many partners in enforcing a world where, as Imelda Marcos put it, perception is real, the truth is not. Some of these partners are from the professionalized, are from the professionalized field of cultural production, academics, national artists, creative writers. Extended assessments of their work are sorely lacking, and I commend Vix for performing through this lecture the vital task of addressing this gap. As Duterte's regime authors a culture shameless in its misogyny and rewrites the law to eliminate our freedoms aided and abetted by the likes of a poet with a reputation as a feminist or a poet with decades of work as a lawyer and judge. We need to fight back, write back, and counter their narratives. Anya Nuevo and Dum Dum, as the lecture rightly points out, are not new. From one regime to the next, the government has garnered the support of creative writers. Some are plain believers, some it has directly employed, some it has bestowed prestige on and provided patronage to. All of them produce its PR and serve as its sin doctors in ways non-literary and literary. We tend to distinguish between the two, to treat the work and the art as separate, even unrelated. But maybe it is time we didn't. It's time for lectures like this, which in its sustained scrutiny of post-truth poetics also calls into question what Sarah Briette calls the terms of consecration of literature, which, quote, most often entail a vision of literary excellence as detached, neutral, ambiguous, complex, and apolitical, and as first and foremost a matter of uh, formal mastery, unquote. Poetry or creative writing for that matter can be and is many things, among them state propaganda. It would be interesting if Vix is so inclined to track the entanglements of creative writing in affairs of the state more thoroughly. The regime of Marcos, the Duterte's idol, would be an obvious period to study. The lecture already references 
say the propaganda work of Kerima Pulotan, publisher of the Above Ground magazine Focus, or Adrian Tristobal, head of the Presidential Center for Special Studies, which was staffed by poets in English. From Cori to Ramos to Erap to GMA to Pinoy, certainly there is an unexamined field there of creative writing practice marshaled to serve state communications and propaganda. I think it is also useful that the lecture notes the poetic devices deployed to humanize the territory or justify the drug war. This sustained attention to the instances in which poetic and post-truth post strategies intersect, firmly places technique in relation to what is served, which disrupts the tendency to regard craft as a purely technical matter. Approached systematically, this can lead to concrete revisions for current times of age-old writing practices that figure in creative writing pedagogy, such as humanized characters made for good complex writing or literature deals with truths and facts. In thinking about the role of poetry in this time of crisis, this might also explore, aside from the poetry of witness modified by Carolyn Fershay, documentary poetry, in which, to borrow from Muriel Rukeyser, poetry quote extends the document. Critical engagement with official archives is central to documentary poetry, harnessing the capacity of poems to go beyond the private, the subjective, the self-expressive. Perhaps as a way to extend the assertion the lecture already made with regards to the necessity of embedding the poems within their social context, Vix might also turn to publishing and print culture studies with a keen eye on the political economy of literary production, the venues in which the poems of Anion Nuevo and Dum Dum were published are, I think, integral to their post-truth poetics. It is strikingly apropos that Anion Nuevo published her poems on Facebook, playground of troll farms, political campaign platform for hire, wholesale seller of personal data, and global surveillance machine. What role does Facebook play in mediating the poet's engagement with her readers? So it's interesting to see that your conversations been happening under the poet, the poet uh, or the readers with poems. The Dundum's poems are published in the anthology Bloodlust, Philippine protest poetry from Marcos to Duterte, similarly provocative. Why does this book ask us to regard Dundum's poems as protest poetry? How is the classification of Dundum's poetry as protest in dialogue with our so-called post-truth era? Perhaps as we open the Q&A, Vix might say a bit about this, uh, the publication context of the poems and how the way they're published, circulated, and consequently received plays a role in what she sees as their post-truth poetics. Vix's interest in cultural production in light of Duterte-era atrocities is also evident in her poetry. I'm thinking in particular of one time, big time. So I'd like to invite her too to say a bit about the impact of this research on her own poetry. Ayun lang. Congrats, Vix, at salamat.